You know, my life changed in July 1968 when I spent oh, just a little bit of time with the greatest guitar player in the world, Jimi Hendrix. Well, we, we didn't talk about music. We talked about the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States. You know, the eye in the triangle and pyramid and its mystic mottos. Yes, that's right. That's that's the same symbol you see me discussing for the last 45 years. <laughs> that's and more recently, on the history discovering National Geographic Sci-Fi and BBC TV, Russian TV, German TV, Canadian TV, you name TVs. And, well, Jimmy had great insight into this symbol. And it was just a couple of years ago I discovered one of his drawings of the eye in the triangle above the pyramid in the book called The Illustrated Jimi Hendrix that he drew in the summer of 1968. Well, less than two years ago, I had the great joy of not only spending a few hours with uh, Jimmy's sister Janie, but we spent a great deal of time with uh, brother Billy Cox and his lovely wife Brenda, legendary bassist and Musicians Hall of Fame inductee. Billy Cox is synonymous with almost any reference to Jimi Hendrix and rock and roll history. From their army days, Billy would always have an extended friendship with Jimi Hendrix. The kindred spirits uh, would have a, a musical chemistry that was nurtured over the years as both performed regularly as Simon for the most prominent blues and rhythm and blues acts of the day. The bond between the two men would write a new chapter in music history. And today, Billy Cox owns a video production company. He has produced numerous blues and myriad, myriad that is, of gospel shows. He co-authored the books, Jimi Hendrix Sessions and Ultimate Hendrix with John McDermott and Eddie Kramer. Billy has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors, among which in 1909, 1909, 2009, Billy Cox was inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame. Billy received the Founders Award in 2010. He, it was, it was uh, given by uh, Microsoft's co-founder, Paul Allen. And in 2011, Billy was inducted into the West Virginia Music Hall. Hall of Fame. This is uh, Billy's third time with us on 21st Century Radio and very special because he recently released a new CD that I just can't stop playing. It's called Billy Cox, Old School Blue Blues. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio, Billy. Dr. Bob, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us, Billy. You're an awful busy guy. I'm glad we could catch up with you. Hey, Billy, how's your wonderful, lovely wife, Brenda? He's doing fine. Uh -huh. Everybody's doing fine around the house. <laughs> well, you guys sound like you were doing fine yesterday, too, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Billy, you are famous for saying, quote, blues ain't perfect. The blues is life. What do you mean by that? It's about life. It's about blues. It's about living. Everyday living. Um, everybody has the blues. I... I'd like to, uh, it's a quote that uh, Albert King said, the baby laying in the crib, he wants to get his bottle kicking and screaming and jumping up and down, and when they give him that bottle, he's quiet because he had the blues. So mm -hmm. if a baby can have the blues, sure enough, anybody can have the blues. And blues is about life, it's about living. You know, when you sing the blues, something really happens to you, doesn't it? It does, if you put yourself into that particular situation. Yeah, you know, when I discovered that, I, I used to like, a walk, like to walk around the street singing, I, <laughs> which, <laughs> which uh, yeah, annoyed a lot of people. But, you know, but, but you know, I used to sing, and I would, I, I'd sing myself out of depressions. I'd just make up songs and just go rolling along. And that's when I discovered, I, you know, it really does work, if, it, if you can bring it out of yourself, that is. Right. Yeah. Now, you've also said many times that the music that Jimi Hendrix played was nothing more than loud blues. Did you say that? I did say that. Yeah, I, you're, we got you on that one, don't we? <laughs> okay. Well, really, there's no way. You know, the old, older blues masters had smaller amplifiers, lightning, Hopkins, and uh, uh, Johnson, and all of these guys who played the blues, even in the early years, B.B. King, very small amps. Mm -hmm. When Jimmy came along, he had bigger amps and played about the same type of music, but it came, they called it 
acid rock. They called it hard rock. But nevertheless, you can call it what you want to call it, but it was nothing more than the blues. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, uh, the, I'm trying to think, what, what kind of blues did he like most of all? Alter blues. Alter blues? Delta, D-E-L-T-A, Delta. That's real, the Southern blues. Well, give me an education here in our listening audience, too. Uh, southern blues, how is it different than, say, the blues we got up here in the north? Well, northern blues doesn't use a lot of harmonicas, and uh, it's more, you know, I didn't realize that there were so many categories. I got on the uh, CD Baby, and mm-hmm. I found 23 uh, different definitions, different definitions really? for blues. Yeah, well, what can you recall a couple that surprised you? Piedmont blues, Delta blues, uh, contemporary blues, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. They've yeah. categorized twenty some odd different uh, type of blues. Mm-hmm. Well, when 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 was your first? I I, I don't know enough about your early early history. Uh, I know that that uh, you spent some time up in Pittsburgh, didn't you? Uh, quite a bit. I was born in, in Wheeling, West Virginia, and then moved to Pittsburgh, and then from Pittsburgh went on to the military. That's right. You... Uh, I was more influenced in Pittsburgh. Well, let's see. I got my blues influence from uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And there was a radio station out of Nashville called WLA, WLAC. It was a 50,000 watt clear channel. Mm-hmm. There was a two fellows, one named John Richburg and Hulse Allen, mm-hmm. and they played all night long uh, R and B. That was my first uh, introduction to R and B. So I go from church music and blues. Now here's R and B. Then I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was a jazz mecca. So I I I I, I, I got my early influences from a lot of jazz artists there. So then by the time I got to the Military, Jimmy had all those influences also, and so we gelled together musically very well because we had all of those influences in our repertoire. Hey, could you tell us, uh, our listening audience, and remind us any, because you've related to us before about your experiences with Jimmy and the Army, but but what was the very first experience you had with him, and uh, uh, where was his guitar at that time? Um, well, I was coming out of a theater, and... Uh, it was raining real hard, and I wound up on the doorstep of service club number one, which time the window was up, and the, which time I heard this, uh, in this uh, guitar playing in its infancy. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to play a song at that time that was recorded by King Curtis called Soul Twist. And he was making quite a few mistakes, but I, I heard where he was trying to go with that, and I liked the flavor he was giving to it. So I went in, and, you know... Uh, Doc, like a lot of us, we, we played instruments in our high schools, and we just laid them down. Uh, mm-hmm. out of, you know, a lot of, I think my sister played a clarinet, my brother played a trumpet, et cetera. So we all had our different instruments we played. And I told him, I said, hey, man, I said, you know, I played a little uh, bass, and uh, can I join you and do a little jam? He said, yeah, check one out at the desk there, and we can do some jamming. So they had a little Dan Electro bass, uh, or was a silver tone, probably, mm-hmm. I think it was. Yeah, they're famous. In the Sears Roebuck catalog. And <laughs> yeah. <that's right. laughs> so I uh, exchanged it from my ID card, and we started jamming, and lo and behold, we had uh, a kindred spirit going on there, and we decided to form a group, and the rest is history. Did you perform uh, for for the other folks in, in service at that time? Yes, yes, we did. In fact, we got so good uh, until uh, I was on jump status, and he was too. So I found out we used to rehearse at the service club number two, even though I met him at service club number one. And I found out that the guy who was a program director was getting discharged shortly. So I went to see the colonel. So the colonel said, how can I go about getting this job? He says, well, you have to terminate your jump status because we're third army here and we you know uh we we can't take uh paratroopers here so oh, we yeah. had i had about a year and so and a couple months left so i terminated my jump status and got that job that boy was had uh left vacant mm-hmm. and guess what it cost me uh two fists and canadian club and fifty dollars <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I, I knew the, the sergeant who wrote the orders out. So I was still on post, still a member of the military, but I just changed outfits. Yeah. And uh, so I had afforded Jimmy the opportunity in the daytime to ghost after, you know, they had them all together and together. And I thought everybody was, nobody was AWOL. 
to let him go. And Jimmy, he, I don't know what, he, he had no job, really. Mm. And so he grabbed his guitar and run down to the service club. And I, my job was to, at 9 o'clock, get there and make sure that they had a uh, cleanup detail that came in. And they, they cleaned up, report to me. And then after they get to clean up, they report to me again. I let them go. But meanwhile, Jimmy would come in the morning and we'd sit around and uh, practice all day long. He did play, practice all day, didn't he? Yes, we did. Yeah, and, and uh, th- th- is it true that he... Uh, uh, had his guitar on on his stomach when he slept at night. That's right. He never had a case for that guitar. Never had a in case. Fact, he never had time to put it in a case. And whenever <laughs> you saw him, you saw him with that guitar if it was permissible. Now, you've had mucho, mucho, mucho experience in playing with many of the who's who in in rhythm and blues and and blues. Which, uh, well, which of them? There are so many. I've got a list here in front of me. It must be at least a twenty some or here. But but which of them uh, did you enjoy working with the most? What? Which of them? What? Which of them of the of the scores that you worked with did you enjoy working with them the most? Besides Jimmy, of course. Oh, Bob. Uh, here in Nashville, I became a member. Of, well, Jimmy, we formed a band called the King Casuals, and this, Jimmy would go out and then he'd get stranded. I said, for me, come back and play a few months, and he'd go back out. And that was the history of him because I had faith in him, and I knew eventually he was going to develop into the type of guitar t- player that the world would 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 recognize and respect. Yeah. And so I stayed here. And then well, after he went off and did what he had to do in order to get his, because destiny was calling him, I stayed here with the King Casuals, and there was a one of the first shows was called the Night Train. Yeah, Night now, Train. Now that no, the offshoot of that was Soul Train. Yeah, yeah. But Night Train was the first. It was a black and white station here, Channel Five, and we played that for a couple of years. And we had a chance to play behind. Uh, quite a few artists would come through town or were, that would come through here. And someone at the uh, uh, found out that we were a pretty good band. Uh, most of us, well, all of us read. Mm-hmm. So there was a uh, show that was opening up in Dallas-Fort Worth called The Beat. This was a bigger form, uh, forming formation of night train shows. So we had an opportunity. Gatemouth Brown was our band leader. Uh and Hall Silence, due to the fact he was the DJ with WLAC at that time, he was the, the MC of the show. So we had Etta James, and you know we, we heard about the passing of Etta, and we like to send out our regards to her family. Uh, she was a great artist, and we, I had an opportunity to play behind Etta James, Little Milton, uh, oh uh, Freddie King, Lou Rawls, Lou Patty Rawls. LaBelle, you name it, all Wilson of the Pitt. great came through there on that show. And we would, we still did the night train show in Nashville, but one weekend out of the month, we would go there and we'd take Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sundays, and get as many artists as we could, and we'd get right back to Nashville. So it afforded us to play behind quite a few of the artists. And then awesome. also, some of those artists got our names and addresses in case we on towns when we would be all. And then we'd go on the road with some of them. I became Mitty Collier's band leader for a while. Mm-hmm. So we had a good time. And, and, and before we knew it, we were playing behind Slim Harpo. I uh, played on a few uh, uh, things that Slim put out. Uh, yeah. T-99 knew and a few of the other songs. So we had a good time at that, at that period. And I had an opportunity to play behind some of the greatest blues and R&B artists in the world. I'll say, uh, you know, that you just named just a couple, but, you know, I think you, did, you didn't mention Patti LaBelle, did you? Yes, Patti LaBelle. Yeah. She was, uh, about that time, with the Bluebell. Yeah, and Blue, Wilson Pickett. Wilson hey, Pickett, yeah. Hey, did, uh, did you ever play behind uh, Sir Walter Jackson? No, I did you know not. Uh, you know. Yeah, Walter Jackson, yeah, I, I knew of him, and I've heard some of the songs that was so many of them, but with Walter, I never played behind him. I think he came a little late. Yeah, he yeah he did, uh, and that that's like me too. I came a little bit late in that too that's myself. It. That's the reason why I brought that up. Uh, Ike and Tina Turner. The reason why I mentioned that was because of I did a, a huge mural on a nightclub called Soul, the Soul nightclub in the city of Baltimore, and. And uh, they, they brought everybody in, and everybody uh-huh. through, and it was just wonderful being an artist, spending time with these guys. 
uh, in this nightclub. It was called the Blackjack, and it was okay. really it was really something. Now, along with fellow friend and star in his own right, drummer Buddy Miles, the friendship of Jimi Hendrix and Billy Cox, friends, would would forever be etched in music history with the Band of Gypsies. Now, the Band of Gypsies was a power trio that fused blues and hard rock. Rolling Stone magazine, note this, Rolling Stone magazine in its 20th anniversary issue in 1987 cited the Band of Gypsies concert as one of the 10 greatest concerts of all time. Now, that had to be something. I mean, one of the ten great – I mean, there's a lot of great concerts there, Billy. Can you, can you re, What can you remember of that particular concert? Can you remember? Well, on my uh, uh, Billy Cox, uh, basis, BillyCox.com, I give some recollections of that. I'm uh, doing some things now that's called this uh, Starman uh, uh, Theory. Mm-hmm. And on my basis, BillyCox.com, you'll see on the Starman series where I'm expressing uh, some of those, uh, uh, the feelings about the Band of Gypsies and some of those things that happened there. But it was an incredible, incredible concert. Jimmy was happy uh, that we were doing that because he had a contractual agreement. You'll see that if you get on com and you go to my uh, YouTube page. Well, but, yeah. Uh, he, was, he, he was extremely happy to get that done. And then the, the crowd was overwhelming. I didn't re- believe we were going to be received like we were. And it was in, we did two shows, uh, New Year's Eve, 1969, and two shows near New Year's Day, 1970. Mm. And all four of those shows were incredible uh, uh, musical accomplishments, I think, for that group. Well, we're going to take our first, or actually our final break of this hour. But for those of you who want to enjoy more insight into the band of gypsies, please go to www.bassistbillycox.com and scroll down to view the two YouTube videos of Starman Productions. They are great. They, <laughs> really, they are terrific. Uh, especially the one that I liked so much dealt with uh, Jimi Hendrix in a certain sense saving a person's life just because of his music and and how those in Vietnam responded to to Hendrix's music, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, how the band of gypsies got together. As a matter of fact, when we come back, let's touch on that and then start playing some of your other music, okay? All right, Dr. Bob. I'll All be right. Bad bad. We'll be right back with Billy Cox, Old School Blue Blues, and The Last Gypsy Standing, and more about Billy Cox and his music and Starman videos, BassistBillyCox.com. Hi, this is Janie Hendricks, sister of Jimi Hendrix, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And more about Billy Cox and his music go to Starman videos, and that is BassistBillyCox.com. Billy, I, I, for the first time, I went up there last night, and I was just astounded by the Star Are you going to do any more of those Star Men things? Yes, we've got one we're going to uh, post probably later on tonight about maybe 10 or 11 o'clock. Well, um, could you give us a little insight on one of them? I don't want to tell the whole story, of course, but how, how and why were the Band of Gypsies formed? Um. Well, everyone knows the story. That is a Jim, Jimmy Hendrix aficionado. Uh, he had signed a previous contract, and uh, uh, these people found out that he was famous, and they were going to sue him for millions of dollars. So, mm-hmm. in having their other way to turn, that's what that song uh, "Last Gypsy Standing" is all about. It's yeah. autobiographical about uh, us uh, joining forces, myself and Buddy Miles, to help our friend who was in need, mm-hmm. and so. Uh, he just they decided to just give him an album, and that band of gypsies happened to be it. So we went, and we rehearsed a couple of weeks. I'm telling the story about about on basis com, the web page there. Uh, but we rehearsed and uh, did those uh, four shows and got him out of his problems and, and the debt that he was in. Yeah, what a hell of a good friend you are. I mean, you know, because he was very worried. And with- yeah, but that's what friendship's all about. I think a oh, lot yeah. of people, a lot of us have associates. We don't have friends, but true friends uh, are there for you in the time of need, and that's what friendship's all yeah. about. Well, Old School Blues, Blue, Blue Blues is your latest album. Why did you feel like you had to return to your roots, Billy? Why well, had to what? Why did you have to return to your roots? 
Why? Because it was it was necessary to go there. But I never left, really. Uh, I've always been in that, that particular area. Yeah. Well, uh, you, the, what's your message here in old school blue blues? Uh, you say, today there is not enough light of the old school blues field. They are, they are just glimpses behind those words. What, what, what and they're they? just glimpses because I think a lot of the, we're hearing watered down, I think in a lot of instances, a lot of watered down blues. Um, but I think a lot of the guys who, and I'm not by myself, uh, there's a lot of great blues guys who have never even, uh, you don't even know their name, but they're keeping the legacy alive, uh, doing what they do. And uh, so I, I have to, my hat's off to those fellows who do that. And I decided just to do this uh, particular album to uh, it, it exemplify my soul and how I feel about the blues. Well, let's talk about the the group that you put together uh, for the CD. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, say, Byron Showman Bordeaux? The guitar yeah. player? Uh, Byron, I met him when he was about 16 years old, and he was, uh, in fact, he's been living in Las Vegas, and he's doing a lot of, quite a bit of uh, stuff around out in Vegas. He played with Bobby Womack for about six years. He played with Buddy Miles for about three and a half years, so he's well experienced, knows what he's doing, and if you get on there and you see there's a song we did, The Voodoo Chow, you see this guy is incredible. Uh, we've got, I've only been on the, uh, uh, on the internet with that for about maybe a month, and we've got over a thousand some hits for that particular song uh, because uh, of, of, of the, the showmanship that that he does uh, on but, that particular one. He, and then we have Vincent Fultz. He's out of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. He's played with the Blue uh, Skeletons up there for years, and he teaches guitar, and an incredible guitar player. Also, we've got Gary Skipper. Uh, he's from here in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's played with... Uh, I first saw him on a television show, and I wondered, where did this guy come from? So we've got great, you know, this group has got a bunch of great musicians in it that really uh, are really professional people. And uh, the sound that we generate, I'm very proud of what yeah. we've been able to do as a group. We all get along. And I tell some groups, if drummer doesn't like the guitar player, try and patch it up. If the bass player doesn't like the drummer, patch it up, because... If there's any ill will in the group, it will show up in the music that you're playing. And it, it, music is, is basically is for healing purposes, but it, it, it's a spiritual form uh, of, 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 of expression. Music is a spiritual form of expression, and a lot of guys don't realize that. And a lot of times they uh, the music doesn't sound as good as it could because they don't they have problems. And uh, well, in in the group that they haven't patched up, and it shows in the music. Well, you do some wonderful gospel music as well. I mean, it's obvious that your life, your life about music is n you're not just a musician. Uh, music is, as you said, it's a healing experience, and you're yes. one of those individuals that you said that for decades. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is a major part of your life, and and frankly, that was the one of the major reasons why I always was also interested in the work of Jimi Hendrix because I felt he was the same way. He wasn't just a musician; he was a healer. He helped heal this planet just like you have. Yeah, and see, Jimmy, on top of that, Jimmy was a true genius. Now, there's a difference. True geniuses, musical geniuses. Now, they create in the now. Which makes their art transcend time. Yeah. See? And uh, like, you know, Van Gogh, Picasso, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, Brahms, Hendrix. But uh, in Hendrix's case, he took the guitar and rock music to another level. Yep, he sure did. Well, I, with your help, too, brother. Well, we're out of time right now, Billy, and I look forward to seeing you. And that's the end of the hour. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and remember, shine your shoes and get a haircut.